Okay, uh, so uh, my name is Zeke Jones. I'm an MRC student uh, at the University of Texas. Uh, with me today is Liz Ogbu. Uh, very grateful to have her. Uh, she is the founder uh, and principal of Studio O, uh, a multidisciplinary design consultancy that works at the intersection of racial and spatial justice. Uh, in addition to her practice, Liz has held academic appointments at several institutions, including UC Berkeley, Stanford's D School, and the University of Virginia. Uh, and she has won many, many awards and uh, been a resident, uh, the Droga Architect in Residence at, in Australia. Uh, so thank you, Liz. Uh, we're really happy to have you. Thank you. Um, so in these interviews, I usually ask a really long-winded first question, uh, and then I and then <laughs> I need to repeat it. So I'm going to start with a really simple question. Uh, how did you become interested in architecture? Yeah, that's a good first question to ask. Um, you know, I, I, I joke that I was the weird child in my family who drew. I um, grew up in a family of social scientists. So my father was a professor of anthropology at Berkeley. My mom is um, in public health. And um, so, you know, I grew up talking about people and how they relate to one another, but I also like loved to draw. I like was constantly making things or drawing things as a little kid. And so um, when I finally, I don't know that I really even knew there was such a thing as, as architecture. Um, when I was in high school, I did end up doing some, some drawings of buildings, but still it never lodged in my head of that as a career. I was actually planning to be an engineer because I thought, oh, okay, well, that's the, the, that's the responsible thing to do with, you know, being able to draw. And stuff. Um, but then I got to um, school. I went to Wellesley College for my undergrad, and I decided to take an architecture class, and I fell in love with it. Um, and for me, it was a way to, even though I would say in the curriculum, it wasn't necessarily set out as a thing that like links this love of of people and community with love of design. I think I saw potential in it to link these two things that felt very formative to how I looked at the world. Got it. And how would you say that a formative understanding um, changed after going through school and being in practice, or if it did? Well, you know, um, architecture, and this was not, it's not like this was like the dark ages. But, you know, I graduated from grad school in 04. But I would say that the curriculum that I was largely taught as to what is typical architecture was very much concerned with like the beauty of the building, the technical things of building the building. But there was very little content about what happens to the people who live in the building or who are impacted by that building or whatever space you create. And so I sort of had to create a curriculum for myself to learn about those issues. So I was actually really fortunate that um, Wellesley, where I did my undergrad, architecture actually was not a full-fledged department. So you, it was almost like you could design your own major. So you could take design studios at MIT. We had a cross relationship with them, mm -hmm. but then you could petition for other courses to count. So I took like urban sociology and urban economics because I was like, I feel like I need to know these things in order to understand the impact of what I'm doing. And I feel like as I have gone in my career, I've continued to do that. I've seek out other ways to understand the people's story and learn more about how to hold that and then bring that back into play with what it means to be a designer. Awesome. Um, so I think I've been a bit disappointed in architectural practice, uh, like the traditional practices that I have you know, worked for and that they don't really, they have a hard time engaging those things. And part of it seems like the patronage system that exists doesn't really allow for that. It is a money-making business or it is a status-making business. And so I'm wondering how you've been able to frame your practice, which I'd say has been very successful in, in changing people's lives. Uh, how, how have you been able to do that? Yeah, you know, I think that architecture I said this on a webinar a couple months ago that like um, when we talk about the larger issues uh, in our society right now, like white supremacy and capitalism and patriarchy, like all of those things are the underpinning of architectural practice. 
practice, both as it is taught and as it is practiced. And they're really about systems of control and power. And when we just participate in it without questioning it, without trying to disrupt it, we are being complicit in the harm that has been laid into the basis of that that system. So I start with that as a, like a core understanding. And so then when it comes to the actual um, doing of projects, I understand that in most cases where the money is coming from are from the systems of power, whether I'm working for a you know, for-profit developer or a nonprofit housing organization. Um, and so, but the people who are probably most impacted are usually not the ones controlling the dollars. So for me, I often say I serve two clients, the people who pay me and the people who, have, who are impacted by what I create. And so our process, traditional process, sort of recognizes that first set and not the second. So I look at how do I design the process so it honors that second set and in particular, if they have been more harmed by the conditions of the past, kind of elevates them even more. And I treat that like the outcome of my process has to not just be a, a building or a space, but like actually that there has been more power distributed to this group so that they have an ability to continue determining what happens in their, in their space. And I would say, you know, I'm fortunate that like a lot of the clients who come to me, it's usually those who've been jaded by traditional processes or have an inkling that they want to change. So that's a start, right? I'm not trying to you know, if someone's not into like any of what I just said, then usually we should not be working together. And I also think that that's an important thing for architects to sort of say, like, we can have a moral compass. And this is not just about, you know, I often hear from architects of like, but if we, we, if we say these things, then like, we're not going to get jobs. And I would say, well, I happen to be very gainfully employed with more projects than I can handle. So I think that there is a market there. But I also think that like, you know, if we talk about any of the conditions that we're seeing in society right now, you know, they have been replicated in large part because people don't feel like they have any power. And I think if you have an ability to make a decision that impacts somebody's life in some sort of way, that is power. And so for architects and what projects we choose to take and what the things we advocate for in the project, like where are budgets being allocated, where is time being allocated, that is all acts of power. And to just sort of say, well, there's nothing we can do. This is the way it's been. This is what my client wants. I sort of say, then you are basically agreeing to be complicit in the harm. So, you know, from everything from how I, who I take on as clients to how I structure the projects, I try to, to contend that and I try to give value to people that the system doesn't actually recognize. Awesome. So, I think there's a large contingency in architecture that's skeptical of the agency of the architectural object, uh, more so than other mediums we're seeing, like even the meme. Um, so I'm just wondering how you uh, maybe see the architectural object as an agent to that transference of power. Yeah, you know, there's a very interesting thing where I feel like there's a conversation about either the object being able to solve all ills or the object not really being able to do anything. And that either or thinking, I think it's really destructive. I think the object solving everything is kind of something that we've still inherited from um, the modernist movement, right? Where we had things like urban renewal, it's where like a lot of the crappy tower public housing ideas came from. Like this, this architecture will solve the ills of the city. And we have all seen that that has been pretty much an abject failure, right? Like it was really rooted in this hero vision of architecture, um, which inherently just replicates systems of white supremacy. So yeah, that was never going to work out well for us. Um, on the other end, the abdication of any responsibility, like we can see that in many cities where we see like the harm that is wrought by the built environment in terms of what you know, resources are allocated or not allocated to see like, well, that's not right either. It's not that it doesn't have an impact. So for me, it's about like understanding that in a project, what we have to be putting our mind towards is what is the outcome we're looking for, not what is the output that is being created. To me, the architectural object is the output. And 
it's not that the output doesn't matter, it's more how is the output working in service of the outcome? And understanding that, um, you know, when I teach, um, I often say that I was taught to think of um, architecture as the period at the end of a sentence. So like, you've looked at everything that's happened and then boom, you create this building that solves everything. And I actually think it's more like a comma, right? Like there's something that has happened before and then will be something that happens after what you can control is where you place that comma because it does influence the things that happen afterwards. So when I go into a project, I, I first ask the question of what is it that people really need and want? I don't go off of the brief that the client has given me, the paying client. I go and ask the other client and try and understand, well, what is their life like? What, where is the opportunity to leverage the resources I have, which is building, um, to actually get them closer to where they would like to be. And then everything else emanates from that. And so the building or the space that emerges at the end, for me, if it's going to be considered successful, it has to come back to that question of, has it enabled them to get closer to where they want to be? Uh, so I think I have time for one more question and I'll, I'll make it brief. Um, and I think your talk is gonna to touch on this in large part. Um, the United States has seen massive political unrest in the last six months. Uh, how do you see architecture engaging this moment? <laughs> it's a very deep and complicated question. <laughs> yeah. I'll talk a little bit more about it in, in my talk, but you know, I think that some of it is that we're very often not at the table Right, like that we kind of consider, you know, we're at the table of these conversations when it comes to like, Liz is a person, right, who has, you know, is committed to causes of social justice, but rarely do we think we should be at the table when it comes to Liz as practitioner, when it, you know, in thinking about, well, what is the role of space within that? And so I think that, um, you know, the spaces that we have are completely unjust, right? They continue to perpetuate harm, often based on issues of race, class, or anything else that exists outside of the quote unquote norm, which is usually defined by white supremacy, capitalism, patriarchy, et cetera, systems of oppression. Um, and so I think the reality though, is that as long as we are separated and selectively harmed by space, we can't actually address any of the other forms of injustice, like racial injustice, social, social injustice, disability justice, et cetera. And so we have to talk about like, how does space participate in linking community in a new way? How does space participate in reckoning with how it has been harmful in the past? How does it become a tool to get people resources that they need and want? How does it become a tool to make sure that anything that is considered different does not become a predictor of the quality of the environment that you get? That the ability to have a place in which you can thrive is a basic human right. And so until architecture and planning like fully engaged in that as like, the project, then, you know, we will continue to be left out of conversations and space will continue to be a predictor of harm. So I think that um, everything from looking at, you know, the, the neighborhoods in which things like, um, you know, the killings of innocent black men and women are happening to looking at the disproportionate COVID deaths that have been happening that you can chart by zip code, like all of that is completely intermingled with space. And so really, if we don't, I think, to answer your question in a long-winded way, <laughs> you know, I think, I think it's not a matter of like whether or not we have a role in this, it's a matter of whether or not we're brave to own up to that role and actually take it on and do something about it. Great answer. Okay. Uh, Thank you so much. It was really nice uh, to talk with you. Thank you for answering my questions. I really, really appreciate it. I look forward to your talk in 30 minutes. Um, <laughs>
you and me both. Um, but yeah, no, they were, they were great questions. So thank you. I appreciate it. And hopefully the talk will add some color commentary to, to some of the comments that I've made. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. It's exciting to see um, alternative forms of practice that are actually engaging these questions. Because I've been so terribly disappointed with architecture thus far. So. Yeah, no, I, I, I feel you've been there. Um, and one of the things I would say is, you know, perhaps the reality is that it's not an alternative form of practice. It's actually the right way of practice. And it's more that we have been practicing wrong for all of this time. And so it's more about the emergence of what, where we need to be if we are like dreaming of a just future as opposed to like replicating the systems of harm that have existed. Like that's what architecture has been in. So I also want to banish the word alternative from our vocabulary. Okay. That's good to know. Noted. I, I totally agree with you. Because <laughs> it's like alternative is a way of like, um, which I called for a long time, like, right, I operated in the margins or I do community based work over here. And I think that that's, you know, uh, it's a language of oppression to marginalize practices that seek to disrupt those systems. So I'm, 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 I'm evangelizing that we all shift our terminology. Okay, I'm, I'm for that 100%, totally agree. <laughs> Great, Thank all you. right, now I'm gonna go and actually properly set up for my talk. I will okay. see you in